Hey everyone, it's Dwayne Monroe, one of the hosts of Film Conversations, a podcast about film focused on political economy, art, and, well, whatever else seems relevant as we talk. In today's episode, which is our second, my co-hosts and I, Dennis Claxton and R.C. Charles Roberts, talk about two films from what's known as the Atomic Age genre of science fiction, Panic in the Year Zero and The Incredible Shrinking Man. Now, Atomic Age, in this context, refers to that period following the use of atomic weapons against the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 by the U.S. when fear, hope, and wonder about atomic energy and atomic weapons were right on the surface of the culture, influencing film and the forms of science fiction and disaster cinema moviegoers saw from the 1950s through the 1960s. Panic in the Year Zero, released in 1962 and starring Ray Milan, tells the story of a Los Angeles family who, while on a weekend camping trip, witnessed the destruction of their city by an atomic weapon and find themselves in a world that is unraveling. The Incredible Shrinking Man, starring Grant Williams and released in 1957, and based on a book, The Shrinking Man by Grant Matheson, is a very different film. A man is exposed to a radioactive cloud while on a boating trip with his wife, and this cloud causes him to begin shrinking, losing height and mass at the rate of about an inch a week. The film, in its way, explores themes of masculinity and even, I would say, human existence. This was a great conversation, uh, but you may at times notice a bit of coughing and sneezing on the audio track. Both Charles and Dennis were a bit under the weather when we recorded, and I became so engaged in the flow of our chat, I forgot at times to mute. But even so, I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as we enjoyed recording it. Now, the way that we do things here at Film Conversations is that one member of the team chooses the theme and chooses the movies to be under review. And these movies were selected by um, the venerable and inestimable uh, Dennis Claxton. So I'm going to actually turn the mic over to Dennis um, before we get into the general discussion. So Dennis, why don't you talk about what it is about these two films that that speaks to you? Um... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, I have a streaming service that I use uh, that I get through the public library. It's called Canopy, Canopy with a K. Hmm. So I was just kind of uh, looking around in there and I saw Panic in Year Zero, which I had seen once long ago. And I thought, oh, I'll watch this. Um, and it turned out, you know, uh, my memories of it are better than the, the movie is, actually. But uh, then uh, I thought of The Incredible Shrinking Man as uh, a kind of pairing because they're essentially atomic age, as you said, films. And um, I think they're, it's an interesting comparison because Panic in Year Zero is basically a you know, survival tale with uh, you know, all, the, all the elements of... I wanted to talk a little bit about American International Pictures uh, that made the movie. Because uh, it's essentially uh, a teen movie as well. I mean, it has Frankie Avalon and his uh, sister. So American International, they really went for the teen market. Uh, I was reading that they tried to make some Westerns, but that they couldn't compete with television for Westerns, for example. Uh, so they, they looked for a, a niche, and they found it in teen movies. They made uh, I Was a Teenage Werewolf, for example. And... Uh, <laughs> The way that they would work, I'll, I'll give you a couple of formulas that they had, but the most interesting in terms of the business of it is uh, they would come up with a title, and then they would come up with a poster, and then they would come up with a story. So uh, I was a teenage werewolf, for example. The guy, uh, his name is Arkoff, one of the yeah. one of the partners that started it, said, oh, man, that is such a great title. <laughs> And that's the way they would work. Um, they also had the guy 
uh, it was two partners that started it. One of them was named Samuel Z. Arkov, mm -hmm. uh, who if you Google images uh, for Arkov, you'll see him most of the time with a cigar in his mouth, a big cigar. So he used his own name to come up with uh, a, formula, a formula, the Arkov formula. So I'm going to read it here. A is for action. Uh, and then in parentheses, uh, exciting, entertaining drama. R is revolution, novel or controversial themes and ideas. K is for killing, a modicum of violence. O for oratory, notable dialogue and speeches. Fantasy, or F for fantasy, acted out fantasies common to the audience. And another F, uh, fornication, sex appeal for young adults. Huh. And then uh, they had uh, the publicity department had a strategy called the Peter Pan syndrome, which goes like this. A younger child will watch anything an older child will watch. An older child will not watch anything a younger child will watch. A girl will watch anything a boy will watch. A boy will not watch anything a girl will watch. Therefore, to catch your greatest audience, you zero in on the 19-year-old man. Interesting. That's and you get Frank, you get like Frankie Avalon, for example. But they made oh. over, over from the fifties to I think around nineteen eighty, they made hundreds of movies. Right, and uh, they made them in about five or less than a week. That's incredible. Yeah, and I, I, watched, I, I think one of my favorite American international pictures is a, a was it Attack of the Flying Saucers? I mean, it's it's uh, I mean, as you said, the title is just just right there. You can even imagine someone just like you know sitting in a diner. Going, oh, attack of the flying saucers. Well, all right, there you go. <laughs> well, you know, and uh, Incredible Shrinking Man was not made by uh, AIP, but uh, it did have an incredible title. I mean, the yeah. book was called the book was called The Shrinking Man. So Hollywood, of course, had to make the Incredible Shrinking Man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, right. But they made. I, I watched a documentary the other night called Schlock. It has some kind of subtitle, but uh, uh, anyway, it was about. Uh, this type of movie, the B movies, mm -hmm. and they uh, one commentator was talking about how quickly they made them, and they, yeah. you, know, you know, they said that you, you couldn't help but the unconscious be expressed yes. in such a quick period when you're not even when you're not really thinking. But I, you know, I, I I agreed with that, but I wanted something a little more solid, and I found a quote from Roger Corman, mm -hmm. who was an uh, American international guy for a long time, yeah, and. Uh, he had, I found a quote from his memoir, which is called How I Made a Hundred Movies in Hollywood and Never Lost a Dime. Huh. And um, he is kind of famous for, he did a, what they call a Poe cycle, Edgar Allan Poe stories. Mm, which, yes, uh, yes. Very familiar. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I think Jack Nicholson was in one or two of those. Yes, he was. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anyway, uh, this is a quote from Corman. He says, I felt that Poe and Freud had been working in different ways toward a concept of the unconscious mind. So I tried to use Freud's theories to interpret the work of Poe, end quote. So that's, uh, you know, obviously that's what he was thinking. And it's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Panic and Use. I, mean, I, I never, you know, I, I, I love Corman films. Like, for example, there's, um, there's uh, one that Corman did um, in the mid 60s, uh, the title which is, just grabs you. Frankenstein must be destroyed. <laughs> it's like, it's just an <laughs> awesome title. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they made these. I also had the idea of uh, double feature because yeah. uh, the first uh, first time we did this, I mentioned that I worked at a drive-in theater. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this is exactly what you would see uh, appearing right. like this. You know, uh, The Incredible Shrinking Man, on the other hand, is... Uh, uh, was not made in five or six days. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we were talking, I think, was it Jack Arnold you said earlier? Is That's that right. Yeah. Name? yeah. Right. So uh, I can send a link to this. I watched, a, there's a thing on YouTube where he's talking about making this movie. And he talked about the, the attention to detail and planning. And it reminded me of Hitchcock. You know, mm -hmm. Hitchcock had the storyboards that were just very elaborate. In fact, I uh, Hitchcock once said uh, that when, he starts filming the movie that was he had lost interest by then mm -hmm. because the planning is the was the most intriguing part for him and this uh you know watching incredible shrinking man you can, you can imagine the work that went into it to build you know giant furniture and pencils you know yes, it was a lot of exactly you know. and 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 for the audience who may not be familiar 
with these two with films. These. And uh, obviously there'll be links to things in the show notes about the, the films. And and uh, both of these are available on, online, actually. Shrinking Men is available um, via the Internet Archive. And I found um, Panic um, through Daily Motion, actually, and was able to, to view it again um, via that. But um, the two films um, are, are quite different. Um, Shrinking Man you know, just conveys, even from the very beginning, this, uh, what at least struck me as like a, a sense of mystery. I, I love how the, the movie begins in which the cloud, the radioactive cloud is appearing from darkness. Um, the characters are not in darkness. They're in a full daylight. But the way that the opening... Yeah, they're, they're, on a, they're on a boat. They're on a boat in a sunny day. But the way that mm-hmm. the, 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 the opening credits are shot, you know, the, the cloud is there and, and the title is there and there's this cloud just emerging from a darkness. And it it's reminded me of, um, of a moment from the 1957 movie, I believe, Them, of the giant ants, in which there's a scientist who says, and it's just, you know, it's giant ants and it seems silly, but one of the things about Atomic Age films at their best is that um, people would make statements that sort of conveyed this, uh, this, this sense of horror um, and wonder at the same time. And so the scientist says something about, um, you know, that when the atomic bomb was dropped or when humanity um, built this and discovered fission, that humanity had entered a new age. And, and that, you know, the terrors and even the opportunities of this age um, are, have not yet been reckoned with, which is a hell of a thing to say in a B movie, <laughs> because it's like it actually just grabs you that, well, this is a B movie, and yet here's this grand and yet quite true statement being made. And so in Shrinking Man, you know, uh, what I was thinking was, yeah, this, this is the way people are thinking about, you know, this uh, atomic energy uh, atomic weapons because you can't see it uh, you can't touch it and, and yet it's you know um there's opportunity obviously energy but there's also the danger of destroying destroying everything well i watched a documentary that you suggested uh it's called how nuclear weapons changed how we think yeah did you watch it you watched it yourself i'm sure yeah uh and the guy said at the beginning he said that uh, the reason he wanted to start making it was uh uh, he showed a clip from a, a speech from uh, Vladimir Putin, Putin yes. uh, who talks about putting strategic nuclear forces on special alert. Yes. Um, and then uh, the guy talks about uh, MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, yes. and talks about how in many ways it brought madness to the forefront of our thinking. Mm-hmm. And in an odd way, the bomb united the world. Yes. And that, remained, that made me think of... Uh, the Smiths, there's a, there's a line in a song, I think it's called Ask, about the bomb bringing us together. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you've got Dr. Strangelove and how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you know, everybody knew about this, everybody in America anyway. You know, yes. everybody, everybody was thinking about it. Yes. And so uh, when you look at Panic in Year Zero, for example, the radio... Uh, they can't get anything on the radio. Yeah. And the daughter says, let me find it here. Uh, the daughter says, not even Connell Rad. Which, yes. uh, that is a precursor to the emergency broadcast system. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, everybody had this, had this looming over them. That's right. And, and yeah, I, I was struck by that because, and I had to look it up. Um, when, when that moment came, um, I, I assumed that it was some kind of government communication system, mm-hmm. um, and indeed it was. Um, but yeah, the idea that um, well, here's this, you know, uh, stereotypical suburban family um, uh, off to their you know jaunty holiday, but uh, but you know, ever present in their minds is the possibility of an atomic war, and when you know they they're many miles um, outside of Los Angeles and. That they, there's a light behind them and they look and they see this you know, massive mushroom cloud, which gives you the impression that it was a hydrogen bomb as opposed to not an atomic bomb. So orders of magnitude more powerful because the mushroom cloud covers what seems to be the entire LA basin, um, uh, um, which an H bomb perhaps might uh, of sufficient power. Um, their reaction to this <laughs> 
what what struck me was that in a modern movie there would be lots of screaming and hollering and you know and and um, people doing various sort of modern um, um, types of acting out because every everything's very emotive now. Everyone has to you know be sort of emoting a lot. And obviously they're emoting. It's very upsetting. Um, um, Ray Milan's wife's character's mother is still well, no doubt dead, but uh, still in Los Angeles. So there's uh, upsetment. Um, and concern and fear, but they just they just snap right to it. They just yeah. snap right to like uh, like oh we have been attacked. Now there's now now there's step B um, or or you know or now we're moving on to the next thing and that that speaks to that speaks to a cultural moment um, that that that's actually I think worth exploring. Well, there's also the elements of the you know, the Arkoff formula that I talked about mm, earlier and, and the right. teenage stuff, because you have a lot of themes that are in all those, in a lot of those movies, like the, the juvenile delinquents, you know, yes. and, um, yes, but, the delinquents. And, yeah. and, and for the audience, there, there's a moment where our family, um, their father, mother, um, um, son and daughter come across these three toughs. And they are stereotypical, like nineteen or late fifties, early sixties kind of toughs with the rolled up jeans and you know, hey pop and yeah. know, the greasy hair and all that kind of stuff. And and they do commit like sexual assault in in the course of the movie. So that you know these are not just and and these might have been um, you get the impression these might have been kids who might have committed sort of petty crimes before things fell apart, but mm-hmm. who now without any fear of um, you know of any retribution or legal sanction you know they're, they they've gone to the next uh the next level yeah yeah and one of those one of that crew uh you might recognize from chinatown that's another fun thing about watching these movies is that you know they're in these uh uh you know these cheap movies and then 10 years mm-hmm. later they're in a big hollywood production i mean yeah. a lot of people a lot of people a lot of people got their start there in yeah. fact Mar- uh, martin scorsese made a movie for ai and he showed it to John Cassavetes, and John Cassavetes said, uh, "You know, this is this is good, but you just wasted a year of your life." He's like, "You know, don't don't get caught up in this." Yes. You know, because they, you know, they are very formulaic. They made, you know, you know like a movie a week. You know, one guy was talking about how they had an extra couple of days, and they didn't really know what to do with it. You know, <laughs> they were so efficient that they actually were done. <laughs> yeah, they were already done. I, I was gonna say, uh, hearing hearing you say that makes me think of uh, um, some of Gore Vidal's essays where he talks about working um, as a screenwriter, um, and he has that character, the wise hack. He never it reveals who that is, and apparently it's a real person, supposedly. Who it is, I don't know. Um, but it made me think. You know, you were going through the the formula, and uh, it made me think of. Uh, what Vidal said about him because he would say things like um, the best hook is, um, you know, children in trouble and, you know, things like that. Like he, he was pretty formulaic in his idea of how movies are made as well. Um, <clears throat> and I was also going to add to the, uh, uh, <clears throat> kind of the, the atomic setting um, and everything. Um, there's a, there's an essay by Will Self, who's a, a English uh, author, um, a, a rival of Slavo Žižek, I guess. And he um, wrote during the very beginning of the war in Ukraine, he wrote about how the, the bomb was making a comeback, and he's referring to the atomic bomb. And that, you know, uh, it, it was interesting to read that essay, but then to watch this movie. Because what I did was I started watching. Um, panic in year zero and then i went out read the essay and then i came back because um he basically talks about how we buried the sense of madness that you see very prominently in this movie although as you know Dwayne said it's it's very controlled which is you know kind of interesting to me but um it was it was interesting to watch it because it, it's kind of like um, how do I put this? It's kind of like finding the root to a plant, really. Um, you you know you get down to you know the the moment in time where you know kind of the and in this case madness, let's say madness, anxieties, and things like that, where it all began. 
and um or at least you know seemingly so and <clears throat> so that's what i kind of found interesting about this movie actually is uh um in in the essay that will self um uh does uh he he both he both uh uh does it verbally and he did and he wrote it down um for point of view which is a series <clears throat> on but he um in this essay um talked about how the um the advent of the nuclear bomb um of the atomic bomb which became the nuclear bomb um and the creation of the mad system and everything um or the mad deterrent um led to what he called kind of a double bind existence and I, i'm going to kind of kick that over to Dwayne because he's it's a cybernetic kind of a terminology and i don't want to mess up its application but to me in the movie um, <clears throat> panic year zero um there's definitely a lot of double binds that mm. you see get progressively more and more intense as the movie goes on like when he first runs into the first gas station attendant mm. you know he pays for gas and everything and you watch, you know, that other person, you know, he slugs the guy, gets in his car and drives off. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, Harry Baldwin um, pays for his gas. But then the next time he runs into that gas attendant who tells him that it's not, what, 30 cents a gallon, it's $3 a gallon. Mm -hmm. He does the exact same thing. He punches him and he takes off. And mm -hmm. So it's a kind of an interesting progression. But uh, I want to kind of kick that over to Dwayne, the concept of the double bind the double bind uh, is a, is a concept that was created by the uh, psychologist rd lang um in the 1960s i believe and lang was in inspired by the, the work of the british uh, cyberneticist and cybernetics um for those who are unfamiliar is uh, is a field of study that looks at um well primarily one of the concepts of cybernetics is the importance of uh, feedback loops in in nature and um, uh, as applied to um, to various things such as computation, of course, and feedback loop seems <clears throat> simple, but it's actually <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually rather profound um, because, for example, you know, uh, there's action, there's reaction, and, and there's there's a, a circle of um, of events um, that occur. There are other there are other ideas within cybernetics, but as as a preface, as as a brief overview. One of the key concepts is a study of the importance of feedback loops. Um, now, the double bind um, was an innovation, a theoretical innovation of R.D. Lang, because Lang took the cybernetic concept of feedback loops and applied it to the mind, and then said, well, there are moments in which there's a thing that you need to do or something that you're called upon to do. Let's say, for example, love your mother, but your mother is a horrible person. And so you were caught in a, in a feedback loop and in a, a bind between the imperative to love your mother, but the reality of your mother being a horrible person. And this puts you into this bind. Um, so it is, in fact, an ap the application of the feedback loop principle to psychological to concerns. Concern. But and but, they and can they also, can be, also be, be seen, seen, as Charlie was saying, you know, in actions such as Raymond's character, you know, he, he wants to continue, at least in the beginning, to do things the way they've been done. You, you get gas, you pay for it. This is what you want right. to do. You want to continue, you know, the, the pantomime of civilization. But he's in a bind because the circumstances, the material conditions no longer support his desire to do that, that dance that we do of, of civilization. Um, and so therefore, he's throughout this movie and everyone, you know, is, is caught um, um, within, within this bind. Right. Yeah, you have you have the uh, Ray Milan's wife, the mother, concerned at what's happening to, especially to her husband and yes. to her her son, because and Ray Milan chastises uh, Frankie Avalon, whose hair is perfect throughout the entire movie. I, <laughs> I know, I love that. No matter <laughs> what, that's that's a double fantastic. line. That's a double line in and of itself. His yeah. hair looks fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but Ray Milan is concerned that he's a little too excited mm -hmm. about yes. Uh, yes. to kill someone basically right yeah, yeah that just, that just whole speech someone. yeah the <clears throat> whole speech about uh i want you to you know be able to use the gun but i want you to hate it that whole 
And, yeah. and I don't know if this, I don't recall if this is explicitly stated in the movie, but my impression of Milan's character is that because of his age and because this was common at the time, is that he was a, a World War II veteran. Like my, my, my vision of him is that he had served probably in Europe or maybe the Pacific in the Second World War, you know, at the, and that he enlisted at around his son's age, that he had seen, you know, violence on a vast scale. And, you know, when the war was over, he's like, well, now I'm going to have a normal life, a beautiful wife, beautiful kids, have a lovely home, have a normal career. And, oh, oh no, now I have to resort to violence again. You know, something that right. I, I thought I, I had left behind uh, when the war was over and I returned, returned home. And th that's how I interpreted that moment with his son when he, as you said, uh, Charles, he's telling his son that, you know, this is a tool you have to use right now, but don't fall in love with it. Right. Um, because, you know, that's the road to psychosis, essentially. Right. Right. Well, you know, there's another um, uh, sort of theme, I guess you could call it, uh, of the returning veteran. There's a crime writer I like. His name is Charles Williford. And mm -hmm. he, he was he was in the service for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think he wrote his first books when he was supposedly serving the country, you know, because there was nothing to do. It wasn't during wartime. But anyway, he had the idea that when people come back, uh, you know, they there's this they have to find some outlet for this violence that they've been living yeah. with. Yeah. And so, for example, I, uh, if I recall, recall correctly, the first chapter of the Hell's Angels were uh, veterans mm. out here in California. That makes sense. Uh, I would have to check on that, but I I'm pretty sure that's true. So, but yeah, I see what you're talking about because he was, you know. It, 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 I mentioned uh, we were talking before. Um, he has this very staccato kind of style, you know. Yes. Just boom, 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 boom. Yes. You know, and the yes. way he speaks, the way he moves, the way you know. Yes. Like when he goes in to get the get the supplies at the store, he's like, oh, you know, we need some flour and this and you know, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, I think I mentioned to you a friend of mine uh, when Reagan was uh, still with us, uh, especially when he was younger. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were watching him give a speech, and my friend said, man, he sounds like a Gatling gun, you know, because it was just boom, boom, boom. One of the things I wanted to talk about was the, I guess, the differences between these two films, between Panic in the Year Zero and um, The Incredible Shrinking Man, because Panic in Year Zero is a, a film that uh, is about... Well, it's about a family, and it's about a family, you know, in a moment of crisis, but it's also about the fear of atomic war, and it's about a society collapsing. But then ultimately, it's sort of hopeful because some semblance of the government remains at the end, and there is an announcement that the United Nations, what remains of the United Nations, has uh, decided, or the, the agreement has been reached, and the war is ending, and now the, the next stage is to rebuild. Um, but rebuild... Um, I guess on on a, in a different order, which is interesting to me, because it's almost as if it was being suggested that there might not be a United States anymore. There might be like a whole new kind of uh, formation, um, and other national formations would be different as well. I might be reading too much into it, but mm -hmm. it was striking to me that there wasn't like a speech from the president. It was the United Nations, um, you know, that the remnants of the United Nations um, was was making a statement regarding. You know, that this is now year zero. We're starting, we're starting human history, recorded human history all over again now, um, because the scale of destruction and death is, is so great. Um, so that those who survive, your your job is to is to is, is to help rebuild right. you know, um, civilization. But you know, civilization on the global scale, uh, apparently. Well, I um, I actually found that interesting that they uh, reset it to year zero, yeah. because the way Will Self begins the essay that I was reading in conjunction with this movie he begins it by saying that a lot of people consider this you know the 2023rd year of uh of christ and he said but he considered it the 60th year uh of of the age of uh Arkhipov, mm -hmm. um the man who didn't um you know fire off his uh nukes yes. uh, during the cuban missile crisis yes so, you know, in a sense, it is almost as if we entered into a new age. And even though we haven't 
I guess, adjusted the uh, calendar. And it hasn't, and hasn't been acknowledged. Um, many people don't know that the United States and the Soviet Union came within a hair's breadth <laughs> of, uh, of uh, having a nuclear war. Oh, and, yeah. We, uh, we were dropping depth charges on uh, the submarine that this uh, individual was in, Arkhipov. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I don't know what sort of um, ultra sense of reasonability um, or how that came over him, but uh, yeah. he didn't fire off anything. So yeah, it's astounding. And yeah, he he was indeed a hero. Uh, yet another time in which a person, a Russian person or a Soviet person, was a hero, and no no one in the West is willing to. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, we we always you know. we always think it's we always think it's Kennedy and his back channel with uh, Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. Which actually was not very successful, yes. because Kennedy would say one thing, and then he'd, you know, well, double bind. He'd say one thing, and then he'd send Bobby to go send some, you know, say mm-hmm. something else. Mm-hmm. So um, <clears throat> that yeah, and, got... we, and we haven't. And, and, and one final final thing about, well, for me anyway, from, about panic in your zero, is that we we ha- we we are still in the atomic age. We are, <laughs> as Will Self wrote in that essay that you're talking about, Charles. Um, nuclear weapons still hang over our heads. Um, we behave as if they don't, um, but they do. And and of course, the um, invasion of Ukraine and the back and forth um, threats threat about, about that um, have uh, have brought <clears throat> the existence of atomic weapons um, back to the minds of at least some people. But the, the, but I grew up. Now I I'm not old enough to to have been, you know, in the first wave of all this. But um, but I was, in the 80s and 90s, I was the kind of kid who studied, like, the NATO books. And I had Jane's Global Fighting Aircraft book. And, <clears throat> and I had all of the stuff about atomic weapons and all of that. And part yeah, of the war, is, um, uh, the war nerd talks about those Jane's books. Yes, exactly. Yeah, when he, yeah. Talk, I, I know exactly what he's talking about when he references those. Because I, I had Jane's fighting ships, Jane's fighting aircraft, blah blah blah. Um, so I, I was the kind of goofy kid who could say, "Oh, you know, the, the NATO code word for the SU for the Sukhoi, you know, twenty two is you know Fox by and blah blah blah." <laughs> but um, this was nerdiness, of course, like gearhead nerdiness, like at the technology of modern <clears> war. <throat> But it also was fear. Like, you know, it was, it was an attempt. I, I, and I remember this distinctly being 12, 13, 14 years old. And this it's just having this distinct sense of fear, not the same level of fear as people in the 50s and 60s, but still some degree of fear um, that, you know, I'm hanging out in, you know, in Philly and just having a decent <clears throat> life. And, and that, um, you know, in an ICBM, um, um, you know, impacts the city because the city was apparently one of the ten targets the Soviets <laughs> right. would hit first. So, right. Um, right. So, you know, targeted for destruction and um, as a coastal city and also as a major mm-hmm. port. Um, and so, what it, what hits me now is that I I don't know if there's a, the same level in your age cohort, Charlie, or those younger certainly a same level of engagement, both at the level of concern or fear, but also at the kind of the geeky level, because those things are combined when it comes well, to your atomic <clears throat> weapons. Um, well, you know, in, in Will Self's essay, um, he talked about um, how our anxieties about the atomic bomb eventually became controlled fears. Mm-hmm. Um, First, he notes that in the sense of uh, he notes the change from anxiety to fears in World War II before everything, Mm -hmm. Um, because the Blitzkrieg, he said, you know, relatively wasn't as bad as people thought it was going to be. And there wasn't a German invasion and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, he, you know, he talked about how oftentimes the reality of things takes anxieties and makes them, you know, um, relatively controlled fears. Mm -hmm. And so. What I've noticed is, as you were saying, the generation before you had anxieties mm-hmm. because it, it was just it was such a constant threat. Yeah. Um, and, and it was I, new. Like the previous generation, it was new. Right. And for exactly. us, it, it was just part of the fabric. Exactly. And so then it became controlled fears in the sense mm-hmm. that, you know, the the mad doctrine, I guess, is it ha- is was taken somewhat seriously and. 
people thought, well, they won't shoot because we won't, you know, mm -hmm. you know, if we did, they did, you know, everything would be destroyed. Well, there was the, um, which I, I think I've heard in the news again lately, the doomsday clock. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And so, but nowadays I think that those controlled fears have become, oh, almost, um, they've almost become forgotten, mm. frankly. And, and, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> I, I'll put it this way. Um, there are um, people who know that it's there, yes. but they seem <clears throat> to have forgotten what a nuclear bomb is. Right. And you, you notice this in kind of the Marvel style response to Ukraine, where <clears throat> people in my generation, but mostly younger, actually, because mm -hmm. I think my generation has a, just a little bit of controlled fear left, mm -hmm. but especially Gen Z seems to think that, you know, and it's probably because of how we've integrated, um, you know, nuclear warfare into our culture in various video ways, so forth, video yeah. games, movies, books, yeah. things like that. You know, we always um, kind of assume that there's going to be a survivor. For example, yes. in, in Dr. Strangelove, it's not assumed that there'd be a survivor. That's correct. Um, but if you look at recent movies about a nuclear apocalypse, either the nuclear apocalypse doesn't happen because something else happens, like a mm -hmm. contagion, mm -hmm. or it does happen, but people survive because they're in bunkers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, basically, you know, in Gen Z, late millennial, it they just kind of assume we'd survive. Yeah. Um, and that it would, you know, you know, our our terrible society would we'd rectify the fact that we hate our society by the fact it get destroyed. And then we just yeah. go back, you know, about trying to create a new one. And so I think that's part of it is that it's integrated mm. into our culture. And so what happens is since it's integrated into our culture, it also gets integrated to other aspects of our culture. Mm. And as you know, I tell people in a, in a grumpy manner, <laughs> we have a very Marvel like mm culture right now mm -hmm. it's very escapist it's very mm -hmm. you know yeah, kind of a super ego morality mm -hmm. with heroes and villains and things like that and then if you integrate nuclear you know the nuclear war right as a, as a cultural phenomenon into that then what happens is is the idea is that if you're on the right side, if you're on the good side, mm. then there will be an Iron Man who can grab the nuke and take mm. it into space and let it explode. Right. Which is not the case. You know, it is absolutely is not the case. And, and, you, so, and you also notice how in, in even in, <clears throat> in uh, post-apocalyptic shows, you know, people are still driving around in, for, in Ford F-150s. Like these things still work. Right, and they're, exactly. and they're driving down roads, you know, that you know, on either side of the road, there's like you know, devastated city. Right, or you or, still drive or down the road. Right, or or somehow there's some power generator that didn't yeah. get hit by something, and yeah. somehow it still works, or somehow they find a you know power supply, or you know whatever. It, it's yeah. it's a very kind of escapist idea, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. this is why I wrote um, the the essay from Will Self had actually inspired an essay from myself earlier mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the war with Ukraine, mm -hmm. or uh, the war in Ukraine, um, where you know, it was called Decent Cannibals, where I was pointing out the fact that you know, the, the Ukraine conflict was being mined for political, yeah. you know, political football over here. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the only way you can do that is if you have a culture that can turn a war like that, which has incredible implications in yeah. so many different ways and turn it into a, a morality battle right yes. you know heroes yeah. and villains yeah even though that's not not really how rather that than looking at the the, the you know the, the actual material situation I, like you can have a moral objection to say an invasion but you also need to, to have to be an adult and and say how, how is this thing unfolding like right in in the real world how is it actually unfolding um you know because even if you are fighting nazis you still have to have an idea of how to fight them and what the material conditions right. are. Right. You know. Yeah, you um, can't. Yeah, you. Yeah. You know. Um, I mean, that's also kind of an interesting thing to bring up about the Nazis. 
Because with the Marvel Universe, if you notice, a lot of the major historical events in America, <clears throat> they insert superheroes into those yeah. historical events, always on the side of the United States, yeah. especially <laughs> with Captain America. Yeah. You know, he goes in there and he kills some Nazis. You know, good on them for killing Nazis, but still, you know, that's not really how we fought that that's war. That's precisely or right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in fact, the the actual superhero was the was the Red Army, um, at, at the cost yeah. of uh, of many millions. Oh but yeah. The, now we, we have spent a lot of time um, mining because even though, as as Dennis said, the movie itself, you know, it's you a know, simple, it's simple movie. movie. It, it's not, um, you know, it's not uh, Vertigo, <laughs> right? For God's sake. Um, well, you although, know, um, I I was just going to say I anticipated, and I think I said this that you know, uh, a couple of times that you know. Panic in the Year Zero, we would just go, we kind of burn through it and talk mostly about Incredible Shinking Man, but we're at uh, 42 minutes and uh, we're still talking. But I, and uh, you know, that's the way, that's the way I hoped this thing would develop. Yeah, is that and, and, we just, you know, take on a life of its own. But, uh, and because there are real ideas <clears throat> there. And, 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 I, uh, um, and as I said in the show notes, I'll have a link to the film. And also, you know, Ray Milan's performance is actually quite compelling. Um, um, not in the way that people think of, say, very emotive performances <clears throat> now, but just the kind of character he is, um, to me at least, it speaks to an idea of masculinity <clears throat> uh, and, and sort of super competence. And this is interesting because, Charles, you were mm -hmm. just talking about superheroes. <clears throat> so the modern concept is that, oh, you know, Iron Man, Thor, blah, blah, blah. At that time, it was just an ordinary person who was cool headed. Like right. that was, you know, that was sort of the, the role of the man uh, was to be cool headed and to be able to, you know, to quote unquote right. rationally work his way through something. And that brings us, I think, to Incredible Shrinking Man, because here we have a story about a man who has a very pleasant life. He has a lovely wife and a good career. And he seems like a decent guy, like the kind of guy as they say you'd have a beer with and so forth and so on so uh, in the beginning of the movie and, and in fact as i mentioned uh, at the top um he's he's having a nice um boating get getaway with his wife but and dennis yeah, she uh, she escapes the mist because she goes uh, she's inside the boat inside but the it's, boat it's, to get a beer but it's not even his boat it's it's is it his brother-in-law's boat i'm trying to remember his uh, his brother's his brother's boat. So you get the impression that, you know, he's, he's, he's not an ostentatious person. He's not a show offy person. In other words, the way that the, the movie is set up, um, you like him, right? You know, you like him with his wife. He's very affectionate. Um, you get the idea that they are, you know, they have lots of sexy time and so forth. <laughs> um, but, um, which is important. Actually, the, 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 um, the presentation of the idea that they are, you know, romantic, with still romantic with each other, still sexual with each other, plays into how the dynamic in the relationship changes as he begins to become smaller and smaller. Yeah. This, um, uh, yeah. So, Charles, Dennis, uh, take it away. I was just going to say, Charles, before when we initially started talking about doing this podcast, one of the ideas Charles talked about was masculinity and the way it's portrayed in, in movies. Mm -hmm. And this. This movie is to a great extent about masculinity yeah. and about how he he becomes literally less of a man yeah. and uh, how he has uh, how he tries to deal with that. Um, one interesting thing about the movie, as opposed to or as compared to the book, which I read over the holidays, uh, it was written, like I said earlier, it was called The Shrinking Man, uh, mm -hmm. it was written by I think his name is Richard Matheson. He wrote uh, he he wrote a bunch of Twilight Zones. He wrote the one uh, with William Shatner seeing the Gremlin on the wing. Oh, right. <clears throat> he also wrote uh, Duel, which was an early oh, Steven right. Spielberg movie. Yeah. So he was one of those guys that just wrote a lot of different kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he uh, the book the the structure of the book is it goes back and forth between him and the seller. And uh, going through the uh, process of trying to find a cure or an antidote or something, you know. Uh, obviously, the movie changed that to uh, just, you know, it, it's pretty neatly divided into mm -hmm. all the tests and all the doctors and the shrinking mm -hmm. and, the, you know, the 
uh, and then he falls into the cellar and then it's a survival tale again a, a more yeah. interesting one a more interesting one in many ways than panic in year zero uh, but the book i think matheson said that he actually was in a cellar when he was writing it so he was sort of looking around hmm. and um he spends as far as i'm concerned far too much time on uh this guy's struggle in the cellar, you know, oh. um, kind of breaks it down mathematically, you know, okay. and which is, uh, you know, how, how long it will take him to do something as compared to, you know, what it would have before just a oh, lot, a lot, a lot of detail. Yeah. And, um, but also one interesting thing about the book is that he is shrinking by one seventh of an inch a day. Hmm. So one inch a week. Hmm. So he knows in his mind, that there's going to come a time when he gets down to zero mm -hmm. and that is absent from the movie. But I think, you know, and he didn't want to uh, change the structure. He, he, he wanted to, I mean, he wrote the screenplay, but he wanted to keep the same structure as the book, but I think they made the right decision because I think it's more interesting the way it was presented. You know, like I say, the, the battle with, uh, you know, the, the way people talk about battling cancer, you know, he was going to, mm -hmm. he was going to overcome and then it becomes mm -hmm. clear that he's not, yeah, but one thing that was interesting was all the tests and everything, you know, which uh, Mr. Drysdale from the Beverly Hillbillies is the main doctor, <laughs> and um, I was watching that and thinking, and this is another thing that came up in that documentary I mentioned earlier about how scientists like Oppenheimer and others uh, became kind of superheroes, you know, that yes. they could, they, they were going to take care of everything, you know, yes. they were going to fix everything, and you compare that now with. Uh, the attitudes toward uh, Dr. Fauci, you know. Yeah. I mean, we're in a we're in a different world here. Yeah. It's but true, it, and and also the. I mean, obviously there were um, in the case of Fauci, we know that you know there's po political games being played in addition to in the fact that you know apparently he did make some rather large errors in judgment, but um, uh, in in with regards to COVID, but. Uh, um, the presentation of um, physicists, in particular, as sort of demigods, um, is, is is fascinates me. Just this idea that, and I think it's because they were dealing uh, literally with invisible forces. You know, like like, like they were actually were alchemists. Um, and and I can only imagine. I mean, the physicists themselves who have you know an understanding of, of where fission and fusion come from. Um, you know, even they're overalled. I mean, I can only imagine what it was like to be at Alamogordo and, you know, you're, you're wearing your smoke glasses and I mean, you know, all the math, you know, all of it. And yet at the time of ignition, this thing happens, like it actually happens. There's this, you know, incredibly brilliant flash. And then just this, this, you know, thing rising towards the sky. It, it must've been, um, uh, overwhelming in a way that I think it's very difficult to, 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 uh, for us to imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You I, know, after all that time and they're like, it worked. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It actually like, Oh, these theories actually, um, bear out in nature, but, um, but, the, but the, the, the concepts are rather the themes of masculinity and shrinking man. So there is a moment in shrinking man that really struck with me where, you know the husband, and it's heavily implied that because um, he's, as you say, he's he's uh, obviously losing um, at a uh, losing height um, and and also mass at a fairly rapid pace. And there's a moment when he's in his normal pajamas, um, and they you know they're looking bigger and bigger on him, and you know he's uh, he uh, it's the late fifties, so of course they don't have the same bed, you know. But the idea is that you know, obviously they they have uh, sex on a fairly regular basis. And so he's looking at his wife and she's looking at him and, you know, the pajama um, pants are long and it's like, oh, well, <laughs> you're, you're not going to be able to, you know, to be, quote unquote, the man with your, with your wife as you had been because a big part of their relationship clearly was their physical connection and, um, and this is being lost. Um, and the, the adults who view this, um, or even teenagers, no doubt understood this, that, that this is what was being communicated, that a, uh, there was a breakage happening, although she's very supportive, although she's in a crisis <clears throat> as well, um, but she's, you know, she loves her husband um, regardless. 
um, both getting more and more difficult for her to, for his wife to think of him as her husband. Yeah, there's that scene when he's living in the dollhouse and yes. she's going out and he's, I mean, it's funny because he's trying to shout, but he's this little man. Yes, you know? he's this and, tiny um, being. Yeah. Yes. And he's like, where are you going? Are you going out? Where are you going? When are you coming yeah. back? You know, and yeah. he's, he, he gets increasingly un- insecure. Yes. You know. and, and and also terrified, which is interesting because mm-hmm. no, no amount um and it's not until he gets to the basement where he's able to how would I put this, where he's able to kind of use his wits, his human wits. Yeah. You know, it's when all the pretense of of the structure of society is gone and he just has to figure out how to survive. And that's almost when you know, it's not that he's being a man, although perhaps that might have been the way it might have been thought of, but it's that he's being human. He's being fully human. He's solving problems um, mm-hmm. as they appear, and he's trying to survive. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier, that the book, uh, the, mm-hmm. so, the problem solving, it just goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't read the I, book, know. I can only imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I think the movie handled that much better because yeah. it concentrated more on just his, uh, uh, well, yeah, the problem solving, but uh, it moves more quickly. Put it yes. that way. Yeah. The, well, you know, a, a good um, as as was the case with Lord of the Rings. You know, a, a good um, a good filmmaker and a good uh, a good screenwriter can um, can take uh, a, um, take something that's comp- that's uh, complex and and preserve its essence, but um, and and convey the main ideas without without sacrificing anything. So, from what you're telling me of the book. It seems as if the filmmakers did did a fantastic job because mm-hmm. when he's in the basement, he's tiny and he's facing spiders and so forth, and you know, and uh, creatures that he would have stomped on or just ignored in the past become mortal threats to him, you know, and he has to figure out how to deal with this situation um, and you know feed and clothe himself again. Um, yeah, that that's handled in, in I think a really beautiful way. Um, I, it's 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 actually quite riveting, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you were uh, you were talking earlier about returning veterans. Jack Arnold, the, the director, uh, he let's see, he's from Connecticut, born to Russian immigrants, read a mm-hmm. lot of science fiction, wanted to become an actor. Um, he was acting in a Broadway play when uh, um, when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Interesting. And he immediately enlisted as a cadet for pilot training. Hmm. But there was, a, there was a shortage of planes. So he was temporarily placed in the Signal Corps where he took a crash course in cinematography. So he became huh. a movie maker basically uh, after joining the service. <sighs> and, he, yeah. and I, you know, uh, I want to put up this link um, of that thing I watched on YouTube because it's him just, you know, uh, for about 20 minutes or so talking about the making of this movie. And he also That's talks about the actor. He talks about the actor, which I can't remember his name right now, but uh, he said he should have won an Academy Award because he did mm-hmm. all this acting by himself. There was nothing. There was no, yeah, his name there wasn't is, another uh, person. His name is Grant Williams. Grant Williams. Yeah. I can't I think of him. I, I can't remember seeing him in anything else. Yes, um, neither, yeah. neither, um, neither can I. And I, I you know, um, both um, Panic and Shrinking I saw originally on TCM. Um, oh, yeah? Because you know, TCM um, would have, a, they probably still do, I have a, like a Saturday program of uh, 1950 sci-fi and Robert Osborne would introduce and explain. And I appreciate it because you, you would get a great deal of background information. And they treated these films... Um, as part of the culture. So rather than, you know, looking down upon them or making fun of them, it's like, you know, these are cultural artifacts um, of particular moments in cinematic history and also in, in, in U S and world history. And um, even whether they're very well made or whether they're schlock, they're, they're, they're communicating something uh, yeah. uh, 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 about a moment. Yeah. Jack Arnold made uh, creature from the black lagoon as well, yes. which is a, another one of my favorites. And that one yeah. is about, you know, I mean, you feel sorry for the creature. You, you know? do. Yeah, you you really feel for him. And I, I remember um, my grandmother. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my grandmother would, would buy my brother and I things that our parents would not buy for us. Mm. So she, uh, you remember the old days when you have plastic models that you could paint and 
you know, you glue them together and paint them. They may still have them. I don't know. I think but we know. had one. We had the we had a creature of the Black Lagoon about. Oh, did you? About this tall. Well. Oh wow, that's pretty big. This, this tall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we painted it, good. and we did we did a pretty bad job of painting it, but it was a lot of fun, you know. Dennis and, uh, uh, was making a gesture that showed about about I, I don't know, uh, um, a little shy of a meter in in, in size. So. Uh, it wasn't that big, but uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe a yeah. foot. Maybe, maybe a, a foot. foot. Okay. Maybe yeah. a foot. But a, mm -hmm. a, a, a sizable um, 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 creature. Um, I actually had a Godzilla <laughs> model. Oh, that yeah? Was, uh, that, that was about that size, yeah. <laughs> and actually, Godzilla is a movie I think that we should absolutely, the original Godzilla is something that I think we need to dive into because it's, um, I think it's, it's a quite significant film. Right. Um, that is misunderstood yeah. by many people. Yeah, and isn't there wasn't there an American version that I I, I remember hearing? Uh, I think I sent this to you guys that that mm -hmm. character Curious Robin uh, mm -hmm. that talked about his favorite science fiction movies. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think he said, have he, mentioned that previously. Yeah, yeah. but I, he said something about making sure that you see the correct version because yes. there was something. They changed it for the American audience. Somehow. Well, for the American audience, um, <clears throat> and since our theme is Atomic Age, there's there's really nothing more <clears throat> Atomic Age, um, for God's sake, than than Godzilla, who quite literally was <laughs> is the creation of atomic power. Um, um, so the original Japanese version, and then there's the version that was made for uh, American release that um, had um, Raymond Burr was inserted into the movie. As an, an American correspondent <laughs> in Tokyo, giving you know reports, and it's actually quite funny because you know he's he's in a building. Now remember, you know he he really sold it. He sold it like you know they 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 filmed him, and he's like he's he's on the radio, and he's like you know I, I can't I, I can't believe what I'm seeing, and you know that kind of thing, and you know they're they're making it look like there's flickering flames, you know, as he's observing Tokyo being destroyed. But in the original, there was no American giving any radio commentary. I mean, um, and his character's name was Steve, by the way. So they inserted just Japanese people saying, Steve, what, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very large monster. <laughs> I, I, I think we can see that, Steve. Um, so uh, I was just going to say we're at 59 minutes. Yes. And um, we're going to wrap up in a, in a little bit. Um, I, I wanted to, to give you an opportunity to, to give any closing thoughts about these two films and you as well, um, Charles. Um, they're, as I've I, said a few times, they're quite different, but I, I, I think that, um, that there is a unifying theme. Well, I did have a question for Charles because you're always mentioning uh, Sartre and I wondered if mm. there was anything, anything that you got watching The Shrinking Man. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. You know, just about existence or the, the <clears throat> in general. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the. I mean, uh, yeah. I don't want to lead you to, uh, too much, but I was, I was curious. <laughs> well, I, I was actually going to say something about Sartre <clears throat> earlier because uh, Dwayne had brought up um, <clears throat> R.D. Lang, who is uh, excuse my voice. Uh, I don't, I don't know what happened here. My mic's not having a problem. I'm having a problem. Yeah, this is what happens it. when you get hit by cars, I guess. Yes, um, indeed. No. <laughs> but um, basically, um, uh, Dwayne had <clears throat> mentioned R.D. Lang earlier. And R.D. Lang is actually was a student of Jean-Paul Sartre, and mm. he mixed um, cybernetic ideas with <clears throat> Sartre in a psychoanalysis, um, and you know that's how he kind of developed his method. <clears throat> but as to Sartre in relation to the Shrinking Man, uh, the Incredible Shrinking Man. I'm sorry, the Incredible <laughs> Shrinking Man. Um, <clears throat> I think that it's. Um, it's interesting um, from a Sartrean perspective because one, Sartre's entire work is based on perspective. He notes that you don't actually ever encounter reality <clears throat> completely. Uh, he says that reality is too much. Uh, I think, and Dwayne can criticize my French here, but uh, the term he uses is uh, de trop, I think. Uh, too much, uh, beyond. <clears throat> And so I think the first thing I noticed with The Incredible Shrinking Man is that as he gets smaller, he gets a different perspective on things <clears throat> that he otherwise thought he knew. Like, 
um, facing the spider, which, as Dwayne pointed out, he would have ignored or crushed, <clears throat> has a new perspective as he's, you know, he has to deal with it to, to live, to survive. Um, <clears throat> there's also, in my opinion, kind of the, you know, the pr presentation of bad faith because it, it works in both movies, but in The Incredible Shrinking Man. So bad faith, the long short of it, is the idea that we rely on beliefs in order to um, <clears throat> mystify our own freedom, how much freedom we have. Um, a lot of people know of bad faith in one sense, which is the idea of um, you know pretending you're an object, you don't have any power, you don't have any choices, you're just doing what you're told, you know, kind of the acceptance of society. What's interesting about The Incredible Shrinking Man, at least for me, <clears throat> is that you see the other side of bad faith, which is the idea of assuming one's ability to do whatever they want, even though that's not how freedom works. It's kind of the assumption, it's almost um, escapism, where you assume that you can do anything you want, and therefore you don't have to you know, pay attention to the world. And the reason <clears throat> that seems to show up in The Incredible Shrinking Man is because the entire time as he's losing, you know, <clears throat> his ability to, you know, have sex with his wife, to interact with society on a normal level, <clears throat> he is almost, um, he's almost desperate in the sense of transcendence. Um, where he, you know, has to believe that even as he gets shorter, he can continue to be who he thinks he is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the way this plays out is actually, it comes in handy as an illusion as he gets smaller, which is what I found very interesting because he ends up having to be, you know, completely human as, as uh, I think Dennis said, he has to be completely human. He has to use his wits and his abilities to kill the spiders and survive as he gets smaller and smaller. <clears throat> and um, I didn't watch it all the way through, unfortunately. Um, I just, it's been kind of a busy week. Um, so I don't exactly know how it, how it ends. But well, um, you, you couldn't have, uh, could have watched it in the hospital. No. <laughs> well, I, well I, I will say that the ending is something that um, actually also <clears throat> to Sartrean themes, I, I believe, um, um, because he essentially, as he gets smaller, he actually transitions. He transitions um, into an entirely different plane of existence, essentially. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right, and, and what's interesting about that for me is that um, not only is it the aspect of perspective um, in, in Sartre, but as he makes the transition, what you see is that um, even in the face of something as extraordinary as losing one's height and going slower, you know, slow, slowly but surely to being completely small, you kind of just shift to a different sort of um, illusion about how you're supposed to interact with life. Because, <clears throat> at least to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the beginning, he kind of seems like a, you know, kind of a society guy. Mm. He does, you know, he, he conforms to how society works. Sure. Um, you know, wife, family, yeah. all that stuff, you know, it, he kind of just, you know, does. And that's one side of bad faith. <clears throat> but then as he gets smaller and he has to do, uh, sorry, he has to do more <clears throat> and more to compensate. Um, he has to assume that he has the ability to, to compensate. And he has to assume that that ability comes from somewhere. I did read the plot. <clears throat> um, I I watched the movie about halfway through um, because I watched all of uh, Panic Year Zero, and then I watched half ish, <coughs> um, close to the end. <clears throat> um, but in the plot, at least that I had read, he <clears throat> he believes that it doesn't matter how small he gets because God knows he's there. Mm -hmm. Is that a correct? summation of yeah um let me read just the the final mm -hmm. uh, part, part of the script mm -hmm. uh he says the universe worlds beyond number god's silver tapestry spread across the night my fears melted away and in their place came acceptance all this vast majority of creation it had to mean something and then i meant something too 
Smaller than the smallest, I meant something too. To God, there is no zero. I still exist. And in the music yeah. and, you know. Right, right. And so <clears throat> it, it, what's interesting about that is you see, um, so in, in Sartre's work, um, <clears throat> whereas in, say, <clears throat> Schopenhauer, there's the pendulum between pain and boredom. In Sartre, there's a pendulum between <clears throat> viewing yourself as an object and transcendence, believing you're beyond <clears throat> all limits. And it's interesting, since you've told me that, uh, at least in my perspective, you watch him, you know, swing from, you know, <clears throat> societal man to somebody who has to, you know, kind of be beyond limits, even though as he, you know, gets more limited. And then there's the acceptance at the end. So he comes, he, you know, he kind of comes right back <clears throat> to accepting himself as a part of society. Um, or I'm not society, uh, the universe. Mm. Um, and God knows he exists. <laughs> And he's an object in the universe, mm -hmm. and he's accepted his faith. It's, you know, it's kind of an interesting study in uh, bad faith, <clears throat> at least to me. Oh well, we, we are the uh, we are the walking or perhaps sitting wounded here. Oh, I was about to say that myself. <clears throat> <laughs> and so we, I will close <clears throat> it here. Um, all of the uh, references that uh, Dennis and Charles and myself have made will be uh, in the show notes. Um, so everyone will be able to, to explore on their own. And, um, as we, we coughingly bid you <laughs> adieu, <laughs> I want to thank everyone for listening to this, uh, to this show. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as a listener and as a viewer, as much as we enjoyed making it. Um, we'll be back in about a month, maybe a little more with another program. Um, um, before we say goodbye, um, any any ideas of what that might be? If not, that's fine because I'll I'll just make an announcement later. Um, I was gonna say that I know I talked to you, Dwayne, about Douglas Sirk. <clears throat> yes. Excuse me. Oh yeah, I love yeah. Douglas Sirk. Well, right, love and, you see, that's Douglas. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. Oh yeah, I, oh, I yeah. saw that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was Excuse telling me. Dwayne here that. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, Dennis, that, uh, Dennis, for those who listen, Dennis was gesturing um, to a uh, poster to a Douglas Sirk film um, uh, mm -hmm. behind him. And speaking of great titles, it's called Written on the Wind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that title. <clears throat> and, well, I had, I'd been mentioning to Dwayne that after Werner Herzog, Douglas mm -hmm. Sirk is my uh, favorite mm -hmm. director. <clears throat> what, about, uh, what about Fassbender? Do you like Fassbender? Um, unfortunately, I haven't seen any of his work <clears throat> that I know of anyway. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, Unfortunately, I'm very much of my age where I will watch a movie and then I don't stick around for the credits. Um, so I, well, I, I, just asked, I asked because Fassbender is a big Douglas Sirk fan as well. Oh. Mm, interesting. That is very that interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but that, that would be somebody I would suggest, su no, excuse me, uh, suggest. Um, <clears throat> Werner Herzog might also be one later on, mm. I'd say. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's fantastic. I, I so um, let's put D D D Douglas Sirk on the list, and we will do our homework, and then have a lovely show. Um, so anyway, for film conversations, uh, I bid everyone uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be. Until next time. <laughs>